kind of want to watch Monsters Arrowheart. is a true crime program about the worst human beings on the planet. These episodes contain graphic detail about murder, rape, child abuse, and torture. Okay, trigger warning is uh, given. Bug. Tweet it, please. I already tweeted it earlier. Lycra TV, chill the fuck out. And the trigger warnings are here already. Please turn back while you still can. Viewer discretion is advised. If you'd like to support the show, you can go to our website, thisismonsters.com forward slash support. There you can find ways to support this show, as well as see a list of charities that help victims of violence. On November 25th, 2014, Devante Hart was photographed hugging Sergeant Brett Barnum during a protest in Portland, Oregon. The two shared an embrace while Devante was attending a protest in response to Missouri's grand jury deciding not to indict the police officers who shot and killed Michael Brown. A freelance journalist had taken the photo and two days later, he sold it to the Oregonian newspaper. The next day, the photo went viral and hundreds of thousands of people had seen Devante on the screens of their televisions, computers, tablets, and phones. What many people saw as a touching moment of peace turned into a nightmare for Devante and his family. The event would send the Hart family spiraling into an abyss that they would never come back from. This is Monsters. Come back and find out that he's deceased. Tapping me on the head, telling me I'm cheating, telling me I'm, you know, let me see your phone. Just kill her. I think Diego Campione is totally in the wrong, and I hope he burns in hell for all his sins. I don't know. I, I do not know what this, uh, fuck, wait, what is this intro? Okay. I do not know the story. Jennifer Hart and Sarah Gengler met while they were both attending Northwestern University. Both were majoring in elementary education. Hart had grown up in Huron, South Dakota, and Gangler was from Big Stone City, South Dakota, right on the border of Minnesota. When Sarah graduated in 2002, Jennifer also quit school. They claimed to have lost friends when they came out of the closet as a lesbian couple, so they moved to Alexandria, Minnesota, and they both began working for the same retailer. They bought a house, and Sarah Gangler changed her last name to Hart. This is the same time that Jennifer had completely cut her father out of her life. Her parents had divorced when she was 12 years old, and she continued to live with her mother, visiting her father on weekends. He agreed to let her move in with him when she was 14, but she started getting into trouble in the time between school and when he got home from work, so he sent her back to her mother's house. Hart may have still resented him for that. He said in an interview that they had a disagreement in 2001, but that it wasn't about her dating a woman. He claims to have not even known about the relationship at the time. In 2004, the women started fostering a 15-year-old girl who only goes by the name Lee. In a 2018 interview with the Seattle Times, the girl recalls being placed with Sarah and Jennifer in the summer before her junior year of high school. She says that the first six months went well, they kept busy with activities that the girl says she had never really done before, like going camping and going to amusement parks. Lee says that she was enjoying living with the couple in their two-story home with their dog and a number of cats. The Hearts had asked her if she wanted to stay with them until she was 18 years old, and she agreed. Sarah and Jennifer began preparing to adopt a group of children who were all siblings. From what Lee recalls, they talked to her about being a big sister, and it seemed like they would all be one big family. The Hearts traveled to Texas to meet the first set of three children they were going to adopt. When they returned, they showed pictures of the children to Lee, and she recalls them all being really excited. Unfortunately, one week before the adopted children were scheduled to arrive, the Hearts dropped Lee off at a therapy appointment and never returned. The therapist had to inform her that she was going to a different foster home. The new family picked her up. What the fuck? Dude, everything leading up to this point is so like... 
Starting off like heartwarming. Up from the therapist, and when they brought her to their home, her belongings were already there. There were reports that Sarah and Jennifer made claims that Lee ate out of the garbage, which she denies ever happening in her interview with the Seattle Times. It was also reported that the women claimed that Lee was suicidal and they didn't want that negative energy around their adopted children. Sarah and Jennifer Hart were planning to adopt six children, two sets of three siblings. Some people might ask why an adoption agency would allow such a young couple to- Okay, to be fair, I assume they're fucking psychopathic murderers. Otherwise, why would there be a story on them? So maybe the, the foster uh, kid got away, uh, uh, thank God. To adopt six children over a relatively short amount of time. The truth is that they shouldn't have. Though the adoption records are sealed, the agency that handled the adoption had a history of violations and was found to have not properly conducted home studies for pending adoptions. The report reads, The Commissioner of the Department of Human Services, DHS, is placing Permanent Family Resource Center's license to receive children for care, supervision, or placement in foster care or adoption on conditional status for two years based on licensing violations determined during license reviews and complaint investigations conducted in February of 2008 and June of 2009. The adoption of 8-year-old Marcus, 4-year-old Hannah, and 2-year-old Abigail was finalized in November of 2006. Sarah continued to work as the manager of the department store, Herbergers, while Jennifer stayed home with the kids. Friends and relatives of the couple said that when they visited, the children never spoke. One relative said Jennifer was uh -oh. extremely strict. She said, quote, If the kids did anything she thought was wrong, she would snap her fingers and say, Get in the corner. No food for you. End quote. The same relative said anyone who questioned her parenting would be cut off. She said, quote, Jen wouldn't have anything to do with you if you disagreed with her. End quote. The next three children, five-year-old Devante, four-year-old Jeremiah, and three-year-old Sierra, were adopted in June of 2000. That's abuse. That, that is through and through abuse. It was only one small mistake that changed the course of the three children's lives forever. Sherry Davis and Clarence Celestine lost custody of their children due to drug use and neglect. Priscilla Celestine was Jeremiah and Sierra's aunt. She had petitioned to gain custody of all three children in 2007. She was an excellent candidate to become the children's new guardian. She was a family member, she had a good job, she moved into a bigger home, and she had no criminal record. The three children, plus another sibling who didn't get adopted by the Hearts, lived with their aunt for about six months with no issues. But when Priscilla's employer called her and asked her to work an extra shift, she agreed and had Sherry come to her home and watch the kids. When a social worker made a surprise visit to the home and found the children in the care of their biological mother, they immediately removed them from the home. Priscilla and her lawyer fought to retain custody of the children, but it was no- Good job, Child Protective Services. Just resubbed for six months. Live summer. No use. The state quickly found the three children a new adoptive family. The other sibling was placed in a psychiatric facility. The Texas Department of Family and Protective Services won't comment on the case. In 2008, a teacher questioned Hannah. Come on, bro. They're just doing their... This is what they gotta do. About bruises she had on her left arm. Hannah told the teacher that she had been hit with a belt by Jennifer. Within months, all of the children were withdrawn from school for the remainder of the year. No charges were ever filed about the abuse. It seems like a majority of the stories I tell about child abuse and filicide include the parents removing the children from school after a couple of reports of bruises. You'd think that that would be a gigantic red flag, but apparently schools and CPS agencies Hi. don't seem to view that activity as suspicious. Wait, this is like, <clears throat> they're still under the custody of the, the lesbian couple, right? Under the In custody 2009, Sarah, Jennifer, and all of the children went to Connecticut, where the couple officially married. In March of that year, the Hearts sent an email to family members. Yeah, I wonder what it was that, uh, that made them magically think like, oh, they're just probably doing normal homeschooling and not getting fucking ritually abused. Numbers announcing that...
They were upper middle class white ladies chat. That's the point. That's what I'm saying. They were planning to expand their family even further. It turned out that Sarah was attempting to get pregnant. In the email, Jennifer wrote, quote, After 10 years of talking about this, we have decided on a donor. This month will be the first time she will have done the actual procedure. It's kind of nerve-wracking, end quote. In July, Jennifer sent another email claiming that the baby didn't make it. How could a young couple raise six kids and pay for in vitro fertilization on a single so salary? It turns out they were receiving between $400 and $500 per month per adopted child, plus social... There it is. Just like the Oklahoma case that we saw. Remember the two uh, from the same channel, the two Minecraft kids that went and murdered their whole family and you were like wondering why there was six siblings? Well, it's because the government was giving uh, them money and uh, the family reportedly wanted to do that. Oh my God, they're wearing fucking Bernie shirts. Oh, Jesus Christ. Oh, I didn't notice that until just now. Social security benefits for two of the boys. This made up a large portion of their income, and some believed it was the motivation for their hasty adoptions. In 2010, Abigail told a teacher that she had owies on her back and stomach. According to Abigail, Sarah and Jennifer had found a penny in her possession and believed that she had stolen it. They held her head under cold water while hitting her. When authorities interviewed the other children, they all said that they had been spanked, grounded and had food withheld from them. Has him, has him, has him, has him. Sarah ended up pleading guilty to assault and was given probation. In 2011, they didn't take the kids away? They didn't take the kids away. Oh my God. Hannah told a school nurse that she hadn't eaten all day, but Sarah denied it was true. Shortly after that incident, all of the children were taken out of public school again, and they began homeschooling. After Sarah's probation was up, the Hearts moved the family to West Lynn, Oregon, a suburb of Portland. They moved into a ranch house that had chickens and goats that the children would take care of. While there, someone made an anonymous report about the Hart children looking malnourished. Authorities opened an investigation and interviewed family and friends about how the children were treated. Sarah and Jennifer Hart were described as harsh disciplinarians who forced the children to raise their hands before speaking and were not allowed to wish each other happy birthday. One family member said that the children were poorly fed. A friend said that Jennifer's reactions were overblown and her punishments seemed unnecessarily harsh. Interviews with the children didn't turn up any examples of abuse, and authorities weren't able to conclude that the Hearts were guilty of any abuse. During this time, Jennifer was... Bro, what the fuck? <clears throat> it's surprisingly harder to take children away from pieces of shit like this. How is it so hard to take him away from pieces of shit like this, but so easy to take him away from, like, a black parent, which we don't know the extent of the abuse on the black mother, like the biological mother. That is actually wild. Like, if they were... If they were, like, uh, taking him away from the parents because, like, of corporal punishment, because of literally starvation, which is actually child abuse. But then they also, uh, the black mother had a drug problem that they took the kids away from the biological mother, which should have a higher, in my opinion, should have a higher fucking metric than, than adopted parents. Like if you're an adopted parent, if you're an adopted parent, you should be placed under significantly higher scrutiny. Am I crazy about this? Like, I feel like adopted parents, people should literally look into way harder and minor infractions should go a lot, like a way, way longer way than, than like the biological parents of the child. That's crazy to me. Is maintaining a carefully updated Facebook page showing a very happy and active family. 
she had photos and videos of the family at music festivals and on road trips. Here's a clip of Devante at the Beloved Festival in 2013. Bro. They literally adopted black kids. Like one would foster a puppy. Like to make fucking cheesy Instagram posts. I'm sorry, that's actually the reality. Look at this. That's wild. It's like that. It's like the people that are fucking, you know, giving their dogs away after COVID. Teen. I mean, this is brutal, dude. What the fuck? I want to make a joke about how this is like, you know, this is like automatic self-report. Like, this is like very strange behavior. What's going on here? Like, bring their, your child to like something like this. But also, I mean, he's just like, why is he crying so much? <laughs> They don't know what's going on with him, dude. <laughs> Can't imagine the smells there. I'm, I'm just gonna. There's no shot that this entire thing is. <laughs> Jennifer Hart commented on the video when it was posted online, quote, I just wanted to take a moment to personally thank you for capturing the video of my son, Devante, with Xavier at Beloved. I was shooting still photos, so I was hoping that a quality video would arise at some point. This moment is forever etched in our hearts, and most likely anyone who is there to witness this raw human love. Devante was wearing his free hug sign that he travels the country with. He's hugged thousands, sharing his love for all. There is a long story behind the emotion and why this moment was so special for Devante. Thank you for enabling everyone to live this moment again through your video. End quote. It seems as though the women used these children, especially Devante, as a prop to display their political opinions. Opinions that were extremely oh, yeah. pro-love and kindness, though they ironically weren't showing any of that to the children when nobody was watching. On November 25th, 2014, the Hearts attended a protest being held in downtown Portland. The Missouri Grand Jury had chosen not to indict the police officer who shot and killed Michael Brown in Ferguson just months earlier. Devante had been holding a sign that read free hugs when an officer approached him and asked if he could have one. A freelance photographer snapped the picture. People shared rumors that Devante was forced to give out free hugs, but there's no evidence that that is true. 
There are many pictures of Devante holding a free hugs sign at various locations over the course of many years. There is no way to know exactly what Devante was thinking or feeling that day, but we do know that the picture would go on to make. Well, I can't. I, I hate that she's like got hella fucking Bernie drip, dude. The boy famous. Once the photo went viral, the family was getting a lot of attention, and television shows were asking to do interviews with Devante. Jennifer refused, claiming she was protecting Devante's privacy. She then claimed that they had gotten death threats and they needed to move out of the area. Authorities said that they have never found any evidence of death threats. It's more likely that the attention was unwelcome, as they liked to keep their family locked behind closed doors, away from prying eyes. In 2017, the family moved to Woodland, Washington, about 30 miles north of Portland, Oregon. This home was on more than two acres of land and didn't have any close neighbors. The closest neighbors were Bruce and Dana DeKalb, who lived in one of the neighboring houses, and they claimed that the family never came outside and always had the blinds closed. In August of 2017, at 1.30 a.m., Hannah jumped out of a second-floor window of the Hart home and ran to the DeKalb home. Bruce was awoken to the sound of someone knocking on the door and went to answer. When he opened the door, Hannah begged him to help her, claiming, quote, they're racists and they abuse us, end quote. She would have been about 14 years old at the time, but the DeKalbs thought that she was closer to six or seven because she was so skinny. Jennifer showed up and took the girl back home with her. The next day, the entire Hart family showed up at the DeKalb house. Wait, what? Wait. <sighs> ...to apologize for the incident. Are you fucking kidding me, dude? No, dude, no! Jennifer explained that the children would sometimes act out because they had all been, quote, drug babies, end quote. Hannah gave the... Okay. What the fuck, dude? That's it. That's it. You're, you're like... You refer to your own adopted children as drug babies? Saying that they're acting out because they're drug babies? It's a wrap, dude. Fucking literally call the cops. Actually, what the fuck are cops going to do? They're going to be like, yeah, they are drug babies. They're black. And then fucking move on, I guess. What do you do in this situation? There's nothing you can do. This is devastating, dude. DeKalb's a handwritten note apologizing for her behavior and saying that what she had said the night before was a lie. When Dana DeKalb asked to speak with Hannah alone, Jennifer wouldn't allow it. She said, quote, we do everything as a family, end quote. The DeKalb's initially didn't want to get involved, but Dana's father was worried about the children and he reported the incident to 911 a few days later. Yeah, there's some kids that I feel is being highly abused. And I hey, can't wait until Monday Looking in uh, Woodland, Washington. What's the address? Oh, good thing you gave the baby up then. I mean, that's late, dude. No. Eight months, my God. I'm sorry, bro. He called 911 two days later, three days later. Like, that's crazy. What was he supposed to do, bro? Take the fucking child? Dude, when you see a 14-year-old that's malnourished like they're fucking seven years old, they look like they're seven years old because of how malnourished they are, and they jump out of the second story of their own house to come to you and tell you, like, my parents are abusing me, you have to call Child Protective Services. You have to call 911. No fucking shot. Like, you don't... You... You, you shouldn't be letting them get away. Address. Okay, I'm going to give you the address of my daughter's house because it's right next door. Okay, and what's going on there? Well, they have four black... Oh my god, it's not even the neighbor. It's the neighbor's dad. ...children, which that part doesn't... Oh my god. Oh, thank god, dude. Okay, never mind. I'm not even mad at that guy. Okay. ...matter, and they're, 
they're new here in Texas, but the other night, a little girl jumped out of the second story window on the roof and then down onto the ground. Yeah, remember when you said, oh, she does, they don't know that? They don't know that? Well, guess what? They did fucking know that. And ran to my daughter, and this is like two. Bro, you fucking see that shit? It's over. Like, you see that? Or, you, or a kid tells you that? It's fucking over, dude. There you go. In the morning, begging them to help her, to help her. When did that happen? Uh, about three, four nights ago. Okay. And my son-in-law doesn't want to get involved, but the more I... Yeah, the son-in-law was the one who was like, oh, I don't want to do anything. The dad is the fucking hero. Finds out about it, immediately fucking calls the cops. I sit on it. I, I just can't live with it. Somebody's got to okay. go there and check and on it. There you how go. old was the little kid that did that, that ran to your daughter's house? About 12 years old, 13. And when they came looking for her, she was begging my daughter not to let them know she was there. And then eventually my son-in-law let them know. And then she had all four of the kids come back later and to say everything. I'm sorry, but I hope that guy feels bad. The son-in-law. It was okay, and they were all standing at attention like they were just scared to death. And I think there's something very serious going on there. And they're here from Texas. The kids might even be kidnapped. Okay. And um, so did the girl ever say why she was scared? No, she uh, she was crying, and, and, and it was 2 in the morning, and my daughter said the biggest problem was she's half awake. She couldn't believe what was going on. And, okay. And... And basically, my son-in-law is like most people. They don't want to get involved. And so he's keeping my daughter out of it. But since she's told me about it, I just can't live with it. I'm very concerned for these kids. I just can't let this go any longer. Those kids, I think, is in very serious danger. This man is incredibly perceptive. He can sense that these children are in danger, and he's absolutely right. He even mentions that the children may possibly be kidnapped. Of course, authorities claimed that there was nothing that they could do. Sometimes it seems like the police are only able to act after a crime is committed. When you I mean, yes, all the time. You mean literally all the time. There has yet to be one single domestic abuse incident where the cops have been able to retroactively operate in a way that, like, protects the, the victim. Straight up. And no, I'm not talking about crime prevention or whatever the fuck, like, whatever kind of, like, uh, psychotic uh, fascist uh, dream that people have about cops doing, like, uh, future crime and shit like that. I am absolutely talking about, like, when there is ongoing domestic disputes, People go to cops all the fucking time because they think that the cops are going to protect and serve them. Not realizing that according to at least some, the latest study that we can physically find, 40% uh, of cops are domestic abusers. The only time cops actually come and do something is if your domestic abuser has succeeded. After the fact. You try to get them to prevent a crime, there's not enough evidence or there's nothing they can do. A few months later, Devante started showing up at the DeKalb's house asking for food. Bruce would give him food and Devante would ask him to not tell his mothers. He eventually came back with a wish list. What do you want him to fucking do? literally what fucking cops are supposed to do go over there see if there's enough probable cause for fucking uh, uh child abuse even from the doorway conduct an investigation come back with child protective yeah. services and do exactly what the fucking child protective services is supposed to do okay take kids away from parents like that containing items such as peanut butter fruits I love that in America, we're so fucking aware 
we are so aware of the insignificance of police as a, in the way that it currently operates that like there's people who are just like what do you want them to fucking investigate what are they some kind of fucking mastermind dude the expectation that cops are supposed to investigate a crime like like kidnapping potentially and child abuse what are you crazy dude Like, I love that. That is the argument, dude. That's the counter to me, is that... Sorry? What do you want them to do? Go in there and kill the black kids? Uh, well, what's up? That's what cops do. I, I don't understand. I'm a Galal. Bagels and cured meats. He asked them to put it in a box and leave it by a section of fence so Jennifer and Sarah wouldn't see it. After this happened about ten times... Dana reported it to the local Child Protective Service. A CPS agent arrived at the Hart's house that same afternoon, and even though they saw the family pull into their driveway in their GMC Yukon, nobody answered the door. The Washington State Department of Social and Health Services, DSHS, reported that they attempted to contact the Hart's on March 23rd and 26th of 2018. On the 24th, the DeKalb said that the Yukon was gone from the driveway. After the Hearts left their house, there were no social media updates, as they worked their way down the Oregon coast into California. Sarah had texted her work on Saturday morning, the 24th, claiming to be sick, but she just didn't show up on the 25th or 26th. One of her co-workers called for a welfare check on the 26th, since she hadn't shown up for work in three days. And who are we checking on? Uh, hey, you see what the, you see what that is? You know what a welfare check is, Chatter? They should have done that for the children approximately weeks ago when that happened. Sarah Hart. And how are you related to her? Uh, just a friend. Tell me the reason that we're checking on her again. Um, she sent out a text message at 3 o'clock in the morning on Saturday morning stating that she was sick, but... Nobody's been able to hold, get a hold of her or talk to her or seen her since that text message. Okay. Or her wife, which is Jen. So we're just concerned. Remember, like, the criminal justice system and the police uh, are brutal in America. One of the parents has already been on probation for, like, assault. You mean to tell me that you see fucking two white ladies and you're just like not going to look the background up? Like, really? Like you hear this from a fucking neighbor and like not a single person is like, let me run a fucking background check on these ladies. I'm sorry. This is actually, this is literally white privilege. Like, uh, someone just knock on the door. Oh. Don't say hindsight 2020, man. Don't say hindsight 2020. There is no hindsight 2020. We're talking about like proper procedure. No, my mom is uh in the back. She just uh knocked on the table. I thought the door was uh someone hit, hit knocked on the door. Hi, could you send a high school dropout named Brad to assess the safety of my neighbor's children? Yeah, nah. Okay, and did she say, when she said she was sick, did she say what was going on, or? She just said that she just is oh. unable to, to come out and wasn't able to go to work and thought she was going to have to go to the doctor. Um, I checked the hospital, so they didn't have any record of her. And I think her phone is now dead. And what is I her? I swear to God, the, the officer daddy voice, like, white women tears can be OP. Like, it, it is, for, for all of the, um, for all of the, the disadvantages the white women have in comparison to the white men, which is, like, obviously OP uh, and needs to be nerfed. I get it. I understand. Like the white women tears build is is so incredibly powerful. It really it really is. It's when you have that alt, 
When you finally build up enough to have your white women tears alt and you unleash it, it's a wrap. Like it just debuffs everything in the in the surrounding vicinity for go. months on end. Uh, phone number. Okay. And just the two of them live there? Or? Uh, and they have six children. That same afternoon, a German tourist reported seeing a GMC Yukon lying on its roof at the bottom of a 100-foot cliff. Both Jennifer and Sarah's bodies were inside of the vehicle. The bodies of Marcus, Abigail, and Jeremiah were what? thrown a few hundred yards from the wreckage. They were all dead. Two weeks later, Sierra's body was recovered from a beach north of the cliff, and a foot inside of a shoe washed up on shore shortly after. A DNA test revealed that it was Hannah's. The body of Devante has never been found. We have uh, the, the vehicle going from 34% throttle to 100% throttle, and there's no subsequent application of the brake. And during that time, you're going from idling, with, with the, 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 the brake has been on, and now you're on the throttle, and the throttle is going to 100%. You're accelerating to, to 20 miles per hour um, as you head towards that cliff face. Uh, our analysis of, the, of, of that data was that this was consistent with this being an intentional act. After analyzing information from the vehicle's computer, it's been determined that Jennifer pulled the Yukon over about 70 feet away from the cliff. She then floored the gas, accelerating to 20 miles per hour before leaving the cliff. The computer indicated that she had not touched the brakes. Toxicology reports showed Jennifer to have a blood alcohol level above the legal limit. Sarah and two of the children had a high volume of antihistamines in their system. None of them were wearing seatbelts. A look at their mobile devices showed that Sarah had made Google searches about Benadryl, suicide, no-kill shelters, and the nature of drowning. One search the fuck does she think a no kill shelter is? I, I, did she, did she think that that was for humans, dude? She probably thought like, oh, you know, I just, I gotta fucking uh, take my, my children that I treat like animals to a no kill shelter. Search was quote, can five hundred milligrams of Benadryl? Wait. She had fucking pets? Shut the fuck up. Shut the fuck up. Are you telling me this fucking animal? This demon had more care and consideration for her fucking animals, her pets, than she did for her adopted black children? Yo, this is literally, like, this is what I talk about when I say, like, white people will see, like, a 14-year-old black kid getting his fucking face pressed into concrete and be like, what did he do to deserve it? But then they'll yell at you for having your dog walk on that same exact concrete. Obviously, not all white people, but, like, there are people like this. There are literally people like this on the planet, dude. Drill, kill a 120 pound woman, end quote. Another said, quote, is death by drowning relatively painless, end quote. And another, quote, how long does it take to die from hypothermia while drowning in a car, end quote. Authorities in Washington state searched their house and didn't find anything suspicious. They did notice a lack of personal items for the children. The room that was shared by all of the kids had no personal items in it, and the house contained only a few board games and library books. The only thing we're missing now is your famous generalizations. These lesbian Bernie supporters, am I right? I mean, I already gave you the famous uh, generalizations. Also, why are you still in here, dude? This person has, like, literally been in this community for so fucking long. God, you are so bent, dude. You are so bitter. Books. One officer wrote, quote, I did not get the indication that children lived in the house, end quote. 
Animal Control picked up the animals that had been left on the property, though nobody knows what happened to their dogs. Most likely why they had searched for no-kill shelters. We can only hope. There are so many questions about why the Hearts decided that this was something they needed to do, but we will never get any answers. If you like this video, 